joining. It's wonderful to have so many of you here. Um, I'd like to just introduce myself very briefly, tell you very briefly a little bit about myself. So I'm Sarah, Sarah Heron, and my business is called True Colours with Sarah Heron. My business is based very much on my own personal journey. Um, in which I struggled with my own personal style, although I didn't know that's what it was, and I didn't, certainly didn't know that's what it was called back then. And I spent many, many years hiding away in big, baggy, black clothes. Looking back, I think it was probably reflective of the dark space I was in at the time, but through exploring colours and styles that suit me best, I underwent a huge personal transformation and that is why I started my business, to help other midlife ladies who have lost their way with their style, perhaps lost their identity, or are ready for a whole new midlife adventure. Because for me, it's not a midlife crisis. Let's leave that to the men and their fast sports cars. No, it's an opportunity for us women to get clear on who we are especially if we've spent years meeting the needs of others and have put ourselves last for a very long time. Any of this sounding familiar? I believe passionately that style can help us springboard our midlife adventures. So let's see how we can reset our personal style post lockdown. So let's create a context. COVID-19 lockdowns have generated much change and had great impact on many areas of our lives. Mental health has been seriously impacted with social isolation being particularly damaging. Lowered self-esteem has been widely reported as the basic human need for social interaction was hugely compromised. Sadly, relationships suffered too in many cases, especially when working from home impinged both physical and emotional space. The Great Resignation is a phenomenon that describes record numbers of people leaving their jobs after the pandemic ends, with greater work-life balance, remote working, and cost saving being amongst the benefits cited. And I, I didn't call this presentation post-pandemic, because I still believe the pandemic is going on, but I like to think that we're post-lockdown. So it's estimated that the share of workers who voluntarily quit their jobs reached a record level in September and is set to continue as people continue to reflect and reevaluate their lives and priorities. Of course, the lockdown has, been impact, has also impacted physical activity levels, with many people, and I hold my hand up here, becoming less active due to shielding or a laptop lifestyle. Although conversely, there have been many thanks to Joe Wicks, who have used lockdown as an opportunity to get fit and increase their activity levels. And then finally, there are many who are still struggling with the, sorry, with the legacy of COVID related illnesses. So whilst menopause isn't COVID related, it has emerged that many women reach crisis point during lockdown due to having to manage menopause symptoms in isolation and often with inaccessibility to HRT and other medicines. So whilst this may appear to be a gloomy picture, it also offers us a great opportunity to evaluate and reshape our personal style. Oops, so Daisy, sorry, gone one too many there. For some reason, there we go. Sorry, skipped a couple of slides there, my apologies. So to keep it simple, the impact of lockdown can be simplified as affecting our personal style in three key areas. And what is both ironic and beautifully fortuitous is that these three ways form the true essence of personal style. One, personality. Two, body shape. And three, lifestyle. So let's take a look at each of these in turn. What we wear is a way of expressing our personality a way of saying a little about who we are on the inside, outside. So if we dress in a way that isn't aligned to our authentic values, then we become slaves to fashion. We're wearing a disparate mismatch of clothes with no consistency or cohesion. And this discord results in odd items in the wardrobe that don't work with anything else. They're what I call the wardrobe orphans. They hang there unloved and often unworn because they just don't go with anything and simply don't feel right on. But you can't quite say why. 
So be clear and consistent in your style personality is an easy fix and immediately elevates your style in a very practical way that appears considered. How do we do that then? So let's look at each style personality. So the first one for us to look at is the eco warrior. And Kate Moss would be a good example here, a lover of ecology and environment and passionate about wearing natural fabrics. So eco warriors are found shopping in vintage shops, charity shops, antique markets, rubbing alongside textile designers, that sort of thing. The girly girl, um, she loves all the fuss and the frills, the ruffles, the, the florals and anything floaty and lacy. So Holly Willoughby has a feminine girly girl style personality. Sassy chic, now think sex and the city. Victoria Beckham or Audrey Hepburn. Essentially, they are elegant and demure, preferring quality over quantity. The quirky creative style personality is epitomized by the lady on the left, Iris Apfel, lover of all things fun, fashion, art, eclectic and expressive personality. The timeless classic is effortless effortlessly elegant. She's got that sort of Jackie Onassis look. Don't you just hate those people that just throw things on and look amazing. Um, she's beautifully tailored. She wears uh, traditional pieces and sharp lines. And then the fun fashionista um, is, as its name suggests, an adventurous fashion-led style personality, colorful, edgy, and catwalk inspired. I always say that my approach is very much more dog walk than catwalk. I'm not a fashionista by any stretch of the imagination. I'm very much more about practical down to earth style. So getting clear on your style personality will elevate your look greatly. You'll look so much more put together and less thrown together. And people will start to take notice of your new look. Shopping becomes easier as you identify the shops both on and offline that will cater for your style. Body shape, love it or loathe the notion. Body shape will greatly influence personal style. I'm passionate about size inclusivity. I'm a plus size lady myself and I speak from a position of experience. Having been so skinny and tall in my early 20s that I had to learn to make all my own clothes because I simply couldn't find anything that fit to now being the biggest I've ever been as a plus size woman. By learning what works for me and my size, I've got to a stage now of body positivity and self acceptance, which is the best it's been in years. My confidence has soared as the compliments have rolled in, simply because I now make informed choices around my clothes in full knowledge of what works for me. Size is just a number. It really, really is. It means nothing. A size 16 pair of jeans can be a completely different size in every single shop that you visit. Social media has got a lot to answer for here. It's created a false and fake world where pressure, peer pressure and societal norms dictate what is and isn't acceptable in terms of size. Nobody sees the number inside the clothes you wear. The number we wear really, really, really doesn't matter. So if as a result of lockdown, illness, menopause or something else you've had to change size, Please don't beat yourself up with a stick. Embrace your newfound curves and dress them in whatever size they need. Nothing looks worse than ill-fitting clothes. Too baggy and they make you look wider and bigger. Too tight and the result is the same. So let's take a look at these body shapes. In general terms, there are five main body shapes. So you may have heard them referred to by names of letters, shapes, fruits, it matters not. Now, I'm not one for labels. I'm actually um, an ex-primary school teacher and I hated labeling children then and I still hate labeling now. But 
I do think that body shape descriptors can help us, they certainly help me to visualize and therefore perceive the attributes of each shape, which then enables us to dress it in the most flattering and complimentary way. So if you can visualize that shape in your head, you can see what needs to happen to make the outfit work. That's my premise anyway. So the fine five main body shapes are known as the apple, the pear, the strawberry, which is sometimes called an inverted triangle, an hourglass or a rectangle. So let's explore how to discover the attributes of each shape and why it's important to understand your own body shape. We begin by simply measuring your shoulders, waist, bust and hip measurements. And I have to say at this point, because a client once asked me this question, she said, Sarah, do you mean just across the front or all the way around? I mean, all the way around when we're talking about measurements, okay? Um, make a note of what those measurements are and use them to discover your body shape. But please, please, please remember, one body shape is no better than another. It's just great to visualize your shape in order to help you shop for clothes that really suit you and fit you well. So firstly, the apple. If your waist is larger or the same as your bust and your shoulders, but your hips are smaller, you're likely to be an apple. You're also likely to have slim legs as an apple body shape, which is a great asset and one to flatter. The pear, this is me. If your hips measure larger than your shoulders, you're likely to be a pair. And for many of us, we've emerged from lockdown as this shape due to that laptop lifestyle where weight gain is carried around the bottom, hips and thighs. A strawberry shape, sometimes called the inverted triangle. If your shoulders measure wider than your hips, you're likely to be a strawberry shape. Um, you've got broad shoulders. I always think of Sharon Davis, the Olympic swimmer for this kind of shape. Hourglass. If your shoulders and hips are very similar and your waist is smaller, you're likely to be an hourglass. This is often considered to be the most well-balanced body shape and Marilyn Monroe is considered to be a classic hourglass with a curvy body and well-defined waist. A figure of eight is a variation of the hourglass. You might have heard of figure eight as well. It's a variation of the hourglass, but has a slightly different bone structure with the figure of eight having higher hips that create a bit of a shelf. And the rectangle. If all of your measurements are fairly similar with no real difference between your waist and your hips, you're likely to be a rectangle. Now rectangles can be slim, athletic, body shapes, sometimes referred to as being a little boyish, but equally can be plus size too. So once we know our body shape, we must now work hard to flatter it by accentuating the parts that we're happy with and downplaying the areas we're less happy with. So the style goals for any body shape are to try to visually create a balanced silhouette or outline of your body. So if you're a pear shape and your hips are wider than your top half, what we do is we add width visually to the top half so that the upper and the lower body are balanced and appear symmetrical, okay? By knowing your body shape and where the imbalance is, we can then choose clothes which will compensate. So try to imagine the body shape inside each of these five blue dresses here. So for example, the rectangle shape, top left. A rectangle shape has few curves. So we choose clothes that add the curves, okay? So the dress top left has got slightly puffed sleeves. It's got a ruffle collar and an elongating central ruffle to the top then quite um, a voluminous, um, softly pleated skirt, all of which add curves to a straight geometric rectangle shape. Kate Middleton is a classic example of a slim rectangle. So she wears dresses with peplums, jackets with shoulder pads, 
pleated skirts, all designed to create curves and volume. Okay. The apple shape seeks to disguise weight and lots of ladies who are going through or have been through menopause will, because of the hormonal changes, likely carry weight in the tummy area. Okay. So an apple shape seeks to disguise weight carried on the upper body. So this dress here, bottom right, adds curves and fullness to the lower body. Okay, the clever use of the ruching across the dress is really effective at de-emphasizing the midsection and tries to create a more defined waist, pulling it in visually. So you might feel that you haven't got a waist, but actually there are tricks that we can do to create one. So the strawberry or inverted triangle shape, dress bottom middle, reflects the wider shoulders of the body shape with symmetrical width to the flared skirt of this dress. So can you see how symmetry would be created there? The hourglass has balanced detail. Remember this is one of the few um, well-balanced shapes. So it's got equal detailing on both the lower half with those um, two lines of buttoning and on the top half, okay? And it cinches in at the waist. The pear shape uses short cap sleeves to add width visually to the top half of the dress with the, fatter, with the flattering fit and flare style that skims over the hip area. Okay, we can be clever with detailing and accessories to draw attention to where we want the eyes to focus. Okay, so can you see how each of these outfits here draws the eye towards a particular part of the body? For a pear shape, for instance, a wide neckline, a statement piece of jewellery, or sparkle around the bust perhaps, such as the um, embellished top there, will draw attention to that part of the body, drawing attention away from the lower part of the body, the hip area, which we're perhaps less happy with. Again, the striped jumper. For a second, do you mind? I've just got a little course. question, um, just based on the last section. Yes. And lady asking, she's saying, I'm a rectangle with no waist. Yes. So should I look for items with a waist? Yes. Yes, the idea is to try and create that waist. Um, so things like a peplum, anything like that, that draw attention to the waist, anything that's belted. Again, um, anything that you can do to visually create the, a waist is, is good. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. No problem. Sorry, I should have stopped for a breather there. Okay. So by being clever with the detailing and the accessorizing, we can draw attention to where we want the eyes to focus. Okay. So can you see how each of these outfits draws the eyes towards a particular part of the body? So for a pear shape, for instance, the wide neckline, a statement piece of jewelry or sparkle around the, um, what we call the portrait area, um, will draw the eyes to those areas and away from the hips. So the striped jumper gives that widening effect um, to the upper torso to complement the pear shape. A scoop neckline with embellishments will again draw attention to the upper body as will the off the shoulder and the headband look. And the lady um, bottom right, who is the rectangle body shape, um, so hopefully the lady who asked the, the previous question um, can see that the by adding that belt, um, it is creating a waist for a slim rectangle. Okay, another trick of the trade, creating a column of color. This is an easy way to trick the eye. What we're doing here is we're creating a column of color with the clothes to draw the eye straight down the length of the body, elongating it and making you look taller and slimmer. So you can see how the sheath of black below the red jacket draws the eye downwards in a continuous line. There's no horizontal line created by contrasting colors worn on top and bottom, which would visually shorten the look. So if we had um, a dark top and white trousers, there would be a very definite horizontal line. So the eye starts at the top of your head, goes on down, hits that um, 
horizontal line, the contrast and stops, therefore shortening your look. On the other outfit, the black is worn on the outside to create the same effect, but you do have there um, the contrast of colors. And just as, as an aside, again, for the lady who asked about the rectangle body shape, that black jacket has detailing around the waist area, which is another um, top tip for trying to create a waist. So you're drawing attention to that waist area. So there are pockets, I think they've got zip details on them. Um, so again, immediately your eye is drawn, drawn to that detailing. So that's another top tip um, on your jeans, trousers, jackets, as I say, um, peplum, belts, anything like that will give that impression of creating a waist. OK, <laughs> many of my clients will tell you that I repeatedly say to them, accessories are a girl's best friend. Forget diamonds. Oh, well, maybe not. But accessories do have a huge role to play in personal style. A few key pieces can elevate a look massively, can create attention where we want it most and can express our personality as well. So think about Prue Leith. She has that bold, chunky, wooden, brightly colored jewelry. You immediately get a sense of her personality just by looking at her accessories, okay? So the same clothes accessorized in different ways can create endless looks and greatly extend that post lockdown wardrobe. So as we've already seen, accessories can be strategically placed to draw the eye's attention to certain areas. Obviously wearing a hat will draw attention to the top half of the torso. And if I go to a wedding or a special event, I will generally have a big hat on because that will again draws attention up here and away from my hips, which is an area I want to personally downplay. Um, where did I get to? V necklines are also universally flattering. We can see um, the lady with the lovely curly hair. She's got a nice open um, blouse or shirt similar to mine, creating that V. And what that does is it brings the eyes in and down, which again is considered to be a slimming look. And the footwear there, if you can wear nude color, flesh color footwear, doesn't have to be heels, they can be flat, or you match your footwear to your hosiery or to the color of your trousers. Again, the eye will just see one line of color, which will have the effect of elongating and making you look taller. If your post lockdown wardrobe is somewhat smaller than pre pandemic, perhaps because a fewer things fit, then accessories can be a cost effective way to create outfit options without investing in new clothes. So here, um, those five outfits have been created by accessorizing in different ways. So that one staple piece, the blue fit and flare dress has been dressed up and down by the addition of different accessories, footwear, bag, jewelry, scarf, jacket. Well, I haven't included scarves on this one, but scarves is another um, really key accessory. So even if you replace the dress with jeans and a white blouse or navy trousers and a top, you've got another five outfits at least. And so much more affordable than buying 10 new mismatch outfits. It's about buying less, but buying well. So having a dress style personality, body shape, and explored a handful of practical style tips, now's the time to consider the third attribute of personal style, lifestyle. And this is often missed. Are you now living in a totally different way from pre-pandemic? Many of us are. Working from home has become the new norm for many, and even those returning to a workplace have reported a lower level of refinement in dress code. A client of mine messaged me today and she said, and she works for um, a, a big blue chip company, she said, our director of HR came into the office today and she had flat black um, biker boots on and a tulip skirt and a denim shirt. And she said, really the dress code seems to have gone down a notch um, in terms of levels of refinement. So I think that that is becoming a challenge for people in the workplace. 
So now's the time to consider actually whether your wardrobe is really working for you. Has every piece hanging there earned its place? Is your wardrobe purposeful and functional because life is too short for wardrobe clutter, which can only serve to create confusion and daily dressing overwhelm? You know, that wardrobe that's full and you've still got nothing to wear. So lockdown's created many lifestyle changes and the way in which we'd like to spend our time moving forward. So perhaps you've left the corporate environment and are starting self-employment. You may have retired or be planning to retire. Your leisure time may be more or less. You may be traveling more, perhaps dating again working out, kickstarting a new social life. The list is endless, but I do think that lockdown has made us all reflect massively on our lifestyle. So I suggest to my clients, any of them that are considering doing a wardrobe detox to complete a simple checklist like this one here, where you make a list of all of the different activities going on in your life, work, volunteer work, clubs, housework, shopping, social life, exercise, family time, and so on. And then consider in an average 18 hour day, how many hours on average you spend on each of those activities. You can then calculate that for a week, but I think you'll be surprised to see actually where you're spending the majority of your time. Why is that important? Because the clothes in your wardrobe need to support how you're spending your time. And that often is a place where the penny starts to drop with people. That actually they've got a wardrobe full of ball gowns, but they don't ever go to, ball, to balls anymore because they're now on their hands and knees with their grandchildren most of the time. So, you know, that's a very practical, simple step to consider. Um, you can even work it out as a percentage of your day, a percentage of your week. It really is quite illuminating doing that exercise. And wardrobe detox is something that I do um, and can help you with. Now, my own personal journey, as I alluded to, with rebuilding my confidence and lifting my mojo began with a colour analysis. OK, now this is a completely natural and physiological process where the colour and texture of a person's skin, the colour and texture of their hair, and the colour and pattern of their eyes are analysed and a range or palette, as we call it, of colours is assigned to them. Now, these are considered to be the colours that are most flattering for them to wear, okay? So wearing those colours will enhance the skin's complexion, make the eyes sparkle, and give you a healthy, youthful glow, diminishing any skin imperfections and dark circles under the eyes, all completely natural. It's like magic. Now I'd hidden away in big baggy clothes for years. In hindsight, I do recognize that it was reflective of the dark space that I was in personally. And when I now look back at photographs of myself wearing black, I just wince. I look drained, I look older, and this happens to many, many women, especially as a part of the natural aging process, where the pigmentation levels in our skin and in our hair start to decline, meaning we can perhaps no longer wear the colours that we once used to wear when we were much younger. And perhaps those, the colours that we've relied on for years, and actually now they're no longer working for us. So after my colour analysis consultation, I began to wear some of my new colours and received countless compliments. People telling me how well I looked, asked if I'd been away on holiday or lost weight because I looked so healthy. These compliments became my confidence fuel and skyrocketed my confidence. I cannot recommend it highly enough. In fact, I often say if I could give a colour analysis to every lady around the world free of charge, I would do. I am so passionate about the difference it makes. Um, colour analysis can be done online across all time zones. And I've got clients in America, Canada, Spain, Europe, wherever. There are many, many benefits of colour analysis. 
your skin will appear clearer and more radiant. The color of your eyes will seem brighter. My partner even said to me, oh my goodness, I didn't realize you had green eyes. That your eyes will be more vibrant, they'll be truer to their natural color. That's quite sad when I think about it, but anyway, that's an aside. <laughs> If you wear makeup, you're going to need less as your skin tone is going to look more even. And wearing your best colours will take years off you. I promise you that. And I don't say that lightly. The other benefits include time saving. When you're shopping, you know what it's like? You go into a store and there's just a sea of rack and rack and rack and rack and rack of clothes. You can literally scan the shop for the colors that you know are your colors in your palette and disregard the rest how good is that you'll also save time as your shopping as your wardrobe will become fully coordinated so this blouse wears with endless other things in my wardrobe because i have things in my wardrobe now that are in my palette it's taken time it's not something i did overnight you'll also save money too as your wardrobe becomes more wearable so all of those wardrobe orphans and all of those other things hanging in your wardrobe that you haven't worn for years will be gone because they're not serving you. So you've got fewer items, but you're wearing them more often and you're making fewer shopping mistakes as you're making more informed, confident choices. So how does colour analysis work? Well, traditional colour analysis systems categorise into cool and warm palettes each taking its name from a season. So you may have heard somebody say, oh yes, I had my colors done, I'm an autumn. That doesn't mean that the lady only wears those colors in the autumn, it means that the palette that we have named autumn are the palette of colors that she should wear all year round. So the two, the two warm palettes are spring, which is what I am, the colors of the tropics, bright and vibrant, and autumn, the colour of fallen leaves in the autumn, muddied browns and greens and rich red and green based teal shades. The two cool seasons are winter. So you've got those icy, clear colours of the jewels, rubies, diamonds, emeralds, sapphires. And summer, I would say, think of a, a Monet's watercolour painting. So they're a little bit washed out. You might call them pastel colours. OK, so those would be the four seasonal palettes in addition to which there are six tonal palettes where a lady has elements of warmth and cool a tonal palette might work better for her or where the colors within the palette are a little bit too saturated or she needs a higher level of saturation as the colors we wear change so too can our makeup colors and whenever you have a colour analysis with me, I will also give you advice on colours of jewellery, um, eyewear, so spectacle frame, shades and makeup. OK, um, so it may well be opportune time for a revisit. Do you know which colours suit your skin tone or do you just pick a colour that you like? Do you have warm or cool undertones? If you are cool, you're likely to have... Um, pink undertones. So your undertone to your skin is cool. It's pink based, um, blue based, if you like. But if you you have peachy skin or olive skin, such as myself, then you have a warm undertone. And people do talk about colors of veins. You've got blue veins, you like it to be a cool palette. If you have green veins, you like it to be a warm palette. That's one of those old wives tales it works to a certain degree but it's a start point anyway if you want to try it for yourself um eyebrows lips and eyebrows become thinner as part of the natural aging process and if you've noticed this happening to you then i'd suggest avoiding dark and matte lip colors okay go for something lighter and something with a sheen or a, a gloss Eyebrows become thinner and will need more definition. So try using brown mascara as opposed to black as a kinder, softer alternative. And consider investing in a lash curler. It's a game changer. So.
So in summary, there is lots we can do to reset our personal style post lockdown. Firstly, identify your style personality and be consistent with it. Secondly, understand your body shape and how to flatter it. As part of this, think about where the detailing is. Accessories are a girl's best friend. Thirdly, do a lifestyle audit and detox your wardrobe if necessary so it works for you now. Not in some dim and distant future when you may or may not lose weight. Um, it works for you now. Get rid of the clutter. Um, consider your colour choices and explore your best colours through a colour analysis. It really is like magic and completely natural, as I've said. Like 10 years younger, but without any of the injections. You'll gain so much from this process. And finally, add a pop of lip colour. I've absolutely skimmed the surface here. I could talk for hours about this. Um, as I've mentioned, there are many more free downloadable guides with practical tips available via my website, which I think is already in the chat, www.truecolors with Sarah, with an H, heron, H-E-R-O-N, dot com. Um, I'm an independent colour consultant and style coach, so I offer one-to-one -one online colour analysis, one-to-one -one style consultations. I have a gorgeous style membership full of lovely ladies for ongoing support. And in fact, for anybody who's serious about getting their personal colour and style together, I've just launched my latest programme um, and I've got an early bird offer for the first 10 people to join. And that again is on my website. If you go onto my website underneath services, you'll see post lockdown style reset. Um, and that's an eight week guided group program. Gosh, as I say, I could talk about this forever. I hope that I've given you lots of things that you can take away, lots of things to think about. Um, there is time, I believe, Denise, for questions. If, people have popped questions into the chat. Um, I'll do my best to help. Um, sure, yeah, so we've got a few questions, Sarah. Thank you very much for that. So um, first of all, um, from Aideen, post lockdown, I'm suddenly really keen on bright colors. Do you think there are any colors one should not wear with each other? I personally love blue and green together, which actually I do as well. That's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, the color that is most significant is the color that's closest to your face. That is what's going to make a big difference to you. So having said, I lived for years in black and I now recognize that black isn't one of my colors and it doesn't do me any favors. I can wear it below my waist. So it's the colors that are closest to your face. And in terms of what goes with each other, I think that's very much about a style personality. Um, if you're confident to carry off bright pink and bright red and do that sort of colour clash thing that was um, very on trend last year, then absolutely do it. Go for it. Um, it's all about expressing our personality. There are no rights and wrongs. Yes, there's the theory of the colour wheel. There are certain colours that work really well together. And again, in the guided group programme, actually, there will be a section, a session on that particularly. Um, but be just more mindful of the colour that you're wearing closest to your face, because that's going to have the greatest impact. Sure, thank you. And so, um, another question again from Aideen um, was, do we change seasons as we age? That's a really good question. Again, thank you. And a question that I get asked all the time. Um, Yes and no. What happens, as I think I've, I've already mentioned, is that the um, pigmentation levels in both our hair and our skin decline. So you may have been um, assigned a winter palette, for argument's sake. So bright, um, clear, icy cold and strong colours. So emerald greens, um, sapphires, rubies, those sorts of colours. As you age and as those pigmentation levels decline they become more difficult to wear let's say so what i often say to clients is have a color refresh a client very rarely completely changes um seasonal 
But what they might do is they might go to a tonal palette, which is perhaps a lower level of saturation of some of the colors that they've been used to wearing. So that, that emerald green might become more of a sage green, a much softer, kinder color. So it's, it's unusual that a client ever completely changes and it's even more rare that a client who was once warm becomes cool. Um, but there might be a little bit of, of variance. So I can offer a color re refresh service sure. for clients that have already had a color analysis in the past, yes. Super, thank you. Um, question from Donna. I'd stopped colouring my hair and I'm more grey now. Should my colour palette reflect this? Again, that's an interesting one. There are two schools of thought in colour analysis. Um, there are certain colour consultancy companies who, and uh, actually this was my own experience, who hide or disguise one's hair when doing a, a colour consultation. So I went for an in-person colour consultation and I had all my makeup stripped off me and my hair was um, put into a white scarf. So I looked a little bit like an Amish lady um, and sat in front of a full length mirror, which I didn't enjoy at all. But that aside, that aside um, because the school of thought under which she trained was that one should look at what was there naturally. My school of thought is that if I want to colour my hair as I have done for years, I don't want ever to change that. So I would work with what's in front of me right now. Unless a lady says to me, well, I've dyed my hair for years and actually now I want to go back to my natural colour. What I would do is I would do a colour analysis that worked for her now, but I would also future proof it so that she had something for when she goes gray. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so yes, in terms of, if you're already gray, yes, absolutely. Then um, you need to wear colors that are going to support your hair color. So essentially that's the key um, that we're supporting the hair color, whether it's nat a natural color or an artificial color. Great, that all makes sense, thank you. Some really nice compliments from people, finding it interesting and useful. Beverly thinks she's definitely a rectangle, for your information. Fabulous. Um, got a question from Ju. Um, what should an hourglass do about arms? I have nasty, scrawny arms. I'm sure they're not nasty and scrawny. Um, should it be elbow length or long, et cetera, to balance out the shape? Um, essentially, three quarters is rather nice and a lot depends on the length of your arm. But essentially, the, the waist is such an asset to an hourglass. Um, so, I mean, again, this is a topic, you know, sleeve shape and sleeve length is a topic that I could against when they're just talking about. But if you imagine putting your arms down by your side, if your sleeve finishes around where your waist is, then that's where the eye is going to be drawn. It goes back to creating horizontal lines. Sure, so for an hourglass. Uh, sorry to interrupt. She's just, this lady just said that she's got short arms. Right, okay. <laughs> well, again, it would be a case of trying to find a sleeve that ended around where her waist was if she were to have her arms by her side because again that'll bring focus in to her waist area sure great thank you and how often should we do a wardrobe detox what would your recommendation be um it depends how long it is since you last did one is the honest answer as a start point so if it's years and years and years since you've done one then you probably will be a little overwhelmed initially. So you might do an initial cull, if I dare use that expression, um, and then revisit again in six months time. But I'd certainly, I would recommend six months. Sure, okay. Doesn't look like we've got any more questions, but please feel free to put anything else in the chat. There, there's one more question, sorry to interrupt. There's one more question saying, where are you based? I'm actually based up in the northeast, um, but as I say, I work online. I can do in-person colour analysis um, if people are local to me, um, but if not, then online works beautifully well, both for colour and style and even a wardrobe detox. Um, Sarah, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear somebody. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't oh, know who it is, but I can hear it's somebody. Chris, it's Chris. I'm having trouble with my audio. Uh, I've tried three devices, but I've given up. So never mind. I can see you. That's the important thing. Um, <laughs> can I ask you a question which I've been discussing this week with various people Come about on. smart casual? <laughs> oh, yes, there's a biggie. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, again, with, that's another topic I, I could honestly spend hours talking about. And I think that the smart casual is probably the most difficult to get right. Yes. Um, I did a presentation recently, actually, one of the monthly tutorials as part of my style membership group um, based purely on the smart casual look. For me, it's about creating a level of refinement, as we call it, and technical speak, um, that you feel comfortable with, but you need to be very clear about the function that you're going to, perhaps asking other people what the dress code is. Um, and I think that the smart casual thing is changing and a, a little bit in the same way as um, um, the workplace, issue yes um, it, it links in doesn't it it does um and even <laughs> going to a wedding these days the young people as i might like to refer to them as you know seem to be very much more dressed down from the days when we all wore heels and um very formal wear so i think in gen and hats nobody wears hats anymore which is heartbreaking to me um but I think it's very much more about trying to combine something that is practical, so read practical for casual, but something that you can perhaps add an element of smart to. My go-to would always be a blazer, a really nice jacket. You can put a nice blazer or a nice jacket over a pair of jeans and a white shirt, and you can look more dressed than you would be without the jacket. So layering, again, is another good technique that I would suggest for smart casual. Yeah. Does that help? Have you got a particular function in mind, Chris? Or... No, it's just it's just generally because um, I haven't worked for a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've got to go back to work. So obviously I've got that in mind. However, it's just when you meet friends for coffee and things like that, and a particular friend who's not from this country um, was asking advice as to what she sh should wear to go to a book club, for instance, and right. meeting with other people. Um, and coming from another country, she's got that added layer of, of questions. <laughs> yes. yes, I understand. I, I was wondering how to help with that as well. I think it's very much about being comfortable i think mm. smart casual is about comfort first and foremost mm. the last thing you want to be is um different from everybody else in the room so if you can kind of get a feel of what the other people wear generally you know where is the venue is it in somebody else's house if it was a book club in somebody's house that would suggest to me that the level of refinement would be one below a book club that was happening in some swanky um, city centre hotel, for instance. So I think that, you know, there's a lot in that. I think it's about just expressing her own personality, really. Yeah, um, I, I, I always think that it's um, it's harder if you're going to different people's houses. That's that sort of, because you want to show respect, don't you? You, you don't want to absolutely. under underdo it no, <laughs> and, and I always feel as though I'm overdoing it even simply uh which I like a blazer uh and jeans but not denim yes. uh, and white shirt I'm a, a, a big white shirt person <laughs> and yep. blazers um and sometimes I feel but perhaps I'm being old-fashioned and too smart when I'm wearing that but if you're comfortable with that Chris I think that's mm that's what's key if you're beginning to sense that to use your expression you're feeling old-fashioned you're feeling as if you've gone too far then just dress it down a little bit um perhaps take off some of the jewelry perhaps think of um no don't do jewelry <laughs> or, or something of that nature something yes yeah. well i'm very casual. simple to start with very pared down very minimalistic mm -hmm. so it's just i just 
don't feel as though I fit in with a young look in that look, although it is my look. <laughs> well, again, that's about, I suppose, being confident in oneself. But if, if, you, if you're wanting to change your look, it's difficult for me to advise, especially when I can't see you. Um, that's obviously that's a, a, dif a difficult dimension. Um, I would suggest, honestly, that you invest in a, a style consultation, which will talk to you about your body shape. Um, it'll give you lots and lots of pointers, even identifying your own style personality. And I can give you advice on how to dress that up, how to dress it down. You know, that would be all very much part of, of that service. Um, yes. And I don't say that from, you know, being very salesy. I'm saying that that honestly yes. <laughs> is yes. the best answer. Um, I, I've just seen a, a comment from somebody which was a, a good um, suggestion about wear, wearing a scarf. However, what I would say is I've been a scarf wearer nearly all of my life and I've got piles of scarves in every colour and shape and size and <laughs> fabric. Um, but... I feel too that that's old fashioned as well now. I think people over a certain age wear scarves. I don't see young people wearing a scarf in, in apart from in the winter, they'll wear a thick scarf. What no, no, no. What's the thought on that? <laughs> We've got a few more questions we'd like to get in before. So thank you so much, Chris. Could we just move on and ask a few more questions if I may? Um, so Pamela says, I try to be smart casual as I'm self-employed, but I don't want to seem too corporate, but I still find trainers and the dress step too far. That's a really interesting question, the whole kind of trainers and dress combination. What would you say to that, Sarah? I love it. <laughs> I never thought I would say that because it's mm. not a look I've ever worn before. But since um, sort of those buffet style dresses became quite fashionable, um, and I am quite tall. I find it hard to be in heels. For me, it just ticks lots and lots of boxes. And I'm always complimented when, when I go out in that sort of look. I think it's one of those looks that one can get away with from being 25 to being, you know, 85. Um, so I think there's, there's a place for that. Again, I go back to just aligning yourself with your own personality. And if this lady is feeling that actually there's a bit of misalignment going on there. It might be a case of just peeling back and just trying to get inspiration from places like Pinterest or magazines and thinking that's the sort of look that I want to um, achieve and then work hard to emulate that in a, in a way that's um, cohesive and consistent. I think that's the, the best way. Great. That's super. Thank you so much. I don't think we've got any more questions now, but I just wanted to say a massive thank you to Sarah uh, from True Colours. It's been a really inspirational evening. I'm sure we're all going to be scrambling around looking for our tape measure, trying to figure out whether a <laughs> strawberry or a pear or some other such shape. I'm certainly going to be trying it out anyway myself. Just to let you know, everyone, that the, um, the actual event this evening has been recorded. Um, so if you want a recap or if you want to share it with friends and family, then it will be on the site within the next few days. And that will also include um, the website address for Sarah, if you want to get in touch, her email address as well. Um, so it just leaves me to say thanks again, Sarah. Thanks so much to the Restless members for your participation. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. We've certainly enjoyed it here at Restless. And uh, we look forward to the next one. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.